My name's Robin Lustig. I'm going to be chairing this evening's event, um, which, although it's billed as a debate, isn't going to be a conventional debate. Um, as you will have observed, there are only two chairs up here for one thing, and we do have five speakers in addition to myself as chair. Um, the way in which we're going to work it is that I am going to do a Q&A with each of our speakers separately, and you will then have a chance to ask some questions as well as they go along. Um, the subject of tonight's discussion I don't think needs an awful lot of background from me. You all know who Julian Assange is. You all know what he has done, what he is accused of having done, where he currently is. Um, I'm sure his story is familiar to everybody in this room. Uh, just in case you need some of the details filling in, he is currently in Belmarsh Prison, where he's serving a 50-week prison sentence for having violated his bail conditions. He faces a extradition request from the United States, who have lodged 18 charges, criminal charges against him, 17 of them under the Espionage Act. Um, if he were convicted of all charges and given a maximum sentence, he could face up to 175 years. What we want to discuss this evening is only in part whether or not he should be extradited to the US, but more broadly, whether he is deserving of our solidarity and support. As you will know, in addition to what he has done as publisher of WikiLeaks, there are also accusations against him in Sweden of sexual misconduct. There are also allegations that he worked either directly or indirectly with Russian intelligence in the run-up to the US presidential election campaign in 2016, which resulted in the election of Donald Trump in order to damage the campaign of Hillary Clinton. Now, whether or not those are relevant is something which we will discuss during the course of the evening. I am going to be as neutral as I can as a chair, but I have written about Assange in the past and I have taken a public position. So in the interests of full disclosure, I will tell you what that position was. I wrote uh, when he was arrested I hope that in due course Assange is not extradited to face trial in the US, but if he is, I hope he is acquitted. That way justice would be done and the freedom of the press to publish material that governments don't want published would be upheld. That is the view that I expressed. I'm going to put that to one side for the course of this evening's discussions in so far as I can. Um, Alan Rusbridger, former editor-in-chief of Guardian and Observer is our first speaker. He has to leave early, unfortunately, which is one reason why he is first up. Um, and of course, Alan, as editor of The Guardian, was in the forefront of the original publication of the WikiLeaks material uh, back in 2010, 2011. He is now principal of Lady Margaret Hall in Oxford. He's chair of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. Alan, your time starts now. Um, <laughs> You wrote a piece in the Washington Post after Assange was uh, dragged out of the Ecuadorian embassy in which you described him as part publisher, part impresario, part source, part activist, part anarchist, part whistleblower, part nihilist. Do you also regard him as a journalist? Did I not add part journalist? I don't think well, you okay. um, you know, I think he is part journalist. Uh, I, mean, I, th I think the reason he's so difficult to, th this case is so difficult, is he has so many different identities. And, and I think he quite enjoyed switching identities uh, and was quite conscious about uh, and, and, and sort of knowing about wanting different identities because it, it suited him. But I would certainly add part journalist to Does it make list. a difference in your mind, whether he's a journalist or not, to how he should be regarded by the rest of us? Well, I think in the law, there are people who know more about the law th than I do. Um, uh, I think uh, the law is, is probably less concerned about that than I think we should. But I, I think the things that he is accused of are things that many journalists do every day of the week, or should do. Um, the charges that he faces in the US. Yeah, so particularly the first two charges. I mean, he went, we went for this strange situation in which 
the first set of charges was ridiculously mm. weak, in my view. And, and that was hel helping Chelsea just, Manning to. Well, hack there were two main things. One, one was you have a source who is giving you information, and you go back and say, "I wonder if you could get more information." Well, I mean, you know, in, 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 any journalist would do that. Yeah. If you've got somebody who's a, a, a goose who's laying a golden egg, you say, "Can I have some more golden eggs, please?" Um, uh, and the, the, the second thing is that I, I think this is my reading of it was that. As Chelsea Manning was downloading a, doc a lot of documents from one particular terminal, there was a suspicion that somebody was going to discover who she was. So uh, I, I read the charge to, s to say that he was trying to help her uh, avoid de de detection by, by hacking in with another. Well, I mean, what, what honorable journalist wouldn't try and help a source avoid detection? So um, I think it, it is quite helpful to think, well, how, how would how would normal journalists mm. behave in this situation? And, and why, why would we not try and defend somebody who was behaving in many respects as many of us would behave? You fell out with him quite spectacularly after a certain period of time. Uh, you wrote in that same Washington Post article, of all Julian Assange's undoubted talents, maybe his greatest gift is the ability to make enemies. He trusts, likes, and respects almost no one. He falls out with his friends and disgusts his opponents. Uh, you said, uh, we fell out, as most people eventually do. I found him mercurial, untrustworthy, and dislikable. He wasn't keen on me either. <laughs> what was it? I mean, can you put your finger on what it was that resulted in the two of you falling out so spectacularly? Well, uh, as I said, I mean, I think he, he falls out with lots of people, um, but I, with, with us, I, I think there was a, a fundamental difference about what he wanted to do and what we wanted to do. So that there is a bit of him that I think is a kind of information anarchist. He, he, he truly believed that he wanted all this information to be free and out there. Uh, and there was a bit of him that uh, th 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 or maybe quite a large bit of him that ha has something like contempt for the people who used to be the gatekeepers, so, so mm -hmm. mainstream media. Newspaper so editors, for example. Yeah, quite. Um, uh, and so this process of editing and redaction and, uh, and um, selecting material and caring about the libel laws and all that was to him something sort of almost contemptible. I mean, he, he saw it as, as a, almost a form of censorship. So part of him was always wanting to go the other way and, and, and just l liberate all this information. Um, Can you just give us an example? I mean, what kind of stuff was there in the original WikiLeaks trove that he wanted you to publish and that you didn't want to publish? Uh, well, I, actually, there was a, a curious incident ab about a, a year later when, when I, um, we hadn't spoken for about a year and I got summoned for interview with him in a, in a, sort of, uh, a, a mysterious venue in the city. Um, and I arrived there and he was filmed. There was a, somebody who was filming me as I came in and it, it turned out he was... He, so he wanted to interrogate me about some of these, these things we had chopped out, which, I mean, uh, there were things I... I could barely remember, but 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 to his mind, we were lily livered because we had published X, Y, and Z. You know, we had we had suppressed things about I don't know oli oligarchs, um, uh, and I'm sure the reason we suppressed them was because the, the laws of libel. You know, I mm -hmm. mean, we we would have been old fashioned and thought we we can't uh, we can't substantiate this claim that is in this document. Uh, and therefore, we're, we're at some risk from publishing this now. So that's the kind of thing that we would, uh, you know, he, 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 his instinct was just to publish it, um, and my instinct was I can't publish it because we're, we're, we're going to lose that in a, in a subsequent libel case, and and that that those sort of niceties didn't weigh as heavily on him as they did on me. What do you make of the argument that if? he indeed is to face charges as a result of what he published. So too should you, the editor of the New York Times, of Le Monde, of Spiegel, and of all the other newspapers that published the material, because in a sense, you all did what he did. Well, I've always said that if, um, you know, no, no matter what the state of our personal relationship was, that if he was ever 
prosecuted for what we did together, that I would always stand alongside him. So I think that's a reasonable question. If, if they were going to uh, prosecute him for what we published jointly, then it would be fair to prosecute us too. I, th I think they're going more broadly than that uh, and, and saying actually there was a period where he he did release huge amounts of stuff that we didn't do, and we, we I say we, that that was us, Le Monde, El Pais, the Spiegel, of the, the, the New York Times, they were the main, and we, 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 we didn't agree with that d decision, and, and so um, I, I don't particularly defend what he did there, um, but I would always defend what we did together. Final question from me. Um, the role that he played in the US presidential election, releasing emails from the Hillary Clinton campaign, is that, in your mind, relevant at all to consideration of whether or not he merits our support? Well, I don't think it is, because, um, because they haven't done him for that, which is it was quite interesting. The charges all relate to 2011 and not to 2016. Now, I think there are things about 2016 that trouble me. Um, so if it were the case that the KGB was hacking into the DNC computers in order to influence a, an, an election, um, that seems to me troubling behavior. And if he was, they were you then, as it were, laundering the information through him. I'm not saying that's what happened, but that's what some people believed happened. Then that is obviously a troubling thing. I mean, the, the, the counter-argument is that in our journalistic lives, we all have sources who have disreputable motives, uh, and it's better just to look at the material uh, generally as a rule. I, I find it was better to look at the documents and say, what's, what story are these documents telling us? And, and, and take that, we'll let that weigh more heavily than the, the motive of the source. And it's fair to say that a lot of other news organizations in America use, use the material. Um, uh, it wasn't just WikiLeaks who, 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 which used it. But anyway, I, th th I mean your question is, is it relevant? Well, I don't mm. think it is relevant because he's not being charged with that for whatever reason. Do you regret at all having published the WikiLeaks material that you published? No. no. I mean, I've, uh, as I say, it, it, the, the stuff that we published, I think, was uh, of considerable importance. Uh, we published it extremely carefully, uh, responsibly, with some of the greatest news organizations in the world. And uh, it was a very, uh, to my mind, a very careful and, uh, uh, and important editorial collaboration to get important material into the public domain. And that, that's what journalism should be. OK. Thank you, Alan. Um, I'm going to take two or three questions from you. I'll, I'll take them all together and then Alan can respond to them and then we will move on to our next speaker. So could I see who would like to ask a question of Alan Rusbridger? Nobody, okay. Silence. One there, one there. Okay, let's take those two. Well, if, you, if you don't mind, I'd like to have two bites of the cherry. Number one, Alan Rusbridger has said that the charges relating to the, uh, <coughs> the uh, working with Chelsea Manning, the initial charges should be opposed, but there are 17 charges under the Espionage Act, which carry 175 years in prison. And there are numerous, not inconsiderable, and uh, reports that, that can be just dismissed, that there is a consideration of uh, the death penalty against Assange. Now, the position that you can defend what uh, was done uh, in direct collusion with The Guardian is an evasion, given the fact that The Guardian has spent years denouncing Assange subsequent to that. And what is the position it's not a question whether it's irrelevant. The relevance is that Julian Assange is being railroaded to the United States to face a life in prison or even the loss of his life. So there has to be a, a far firmer position on The Guardian uh, on that issue. Number two, if The Guardian does want to oppose the extradition of Julian Assange, and it's been raised about whether or not 
he colluded with Putin over the um, elections, and then it was acknowledged that many, many organisations... Can I ask you to be as brief as possible, right. please? Cause you well, is The Guardian going to withdraw the bogus story about Assange meeting Paul Manafort? That's, my, that's number two. Yes. Let me... I mean, but before we get on to the next question, you are aware, I know, that Alan is no longer editor of The Guardian. However, uh, there, was another, there, there was another question down here. Yeah. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, thank you very much. Um, I have worked for an organization that has had uh, trolling from Russian-linked groups in, in a rather similar way to the Guardian has had in, in relation to what's just been said. Uh, so getting the same things as the Guardian got. Um, my question is, did, did you do um, a formal or informal psychological profile of Mr. Assange when he first approached? And did you update that? And do you do it with other sources? I'm not asking you to say what any assessment was, but do, do, do you assess people for um, their character and um, psychology and how that might impact on what they're saying or not saying? Thank you. OK, one more question there. Yeah, sorry. Thanks very much, Mr. Rusbridger. I find this very confusing um, on an ethical basis. And I wonder if we're all on the same page ethically. So I wonder, th to check that, if you would tell us whether you agree that it is the duty of every man Jack and woman Jill, you, me, and the Home Secretary, on becoming aware of a serious crime to make it put it in front of the public that the public must know and that in order for somebody to be able to do that without fear or favor it is the solemn obligation of that society to see to it that that person enacting that duty cannot be got at by those people who oppose his exercising that duty the people who didn't want it to come out he should be protected there's nothing whatsoever in the press so weak on that, for instance. And you also said that the, uh, you, you supported what you did with Assange, but what's the legacy of having published those terrible atrocities? What's the legacy? You went quiet about it in the end. There was no campaign. But Thank what you. are the ethics? Thank you. Okay, Alan. Um, on the, on the, the, the first question was about the use of the Espionage Act. So I said that the first set of charges was ridiculously weak to my mind, and then we went to a series of charges that is ridiculously over the top. So whatever Julian did, I don't think we can call it espionage, and I think it's inappropriate to use the Espionage Act, uh, and I think it's wrong to use uh, a piece of legislation against which there is no defense. You, you're not allowed to argue any public interest defense. Uh, and I think another reason why it's wrong is, is that uh, uh, Assange is not American, he's an Australian. Uh, and I find, again, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, and we'll, we'll hear from lawyers soon, but I've, I find it very troubling that if, if, w if, if we're, we're establishing a new law in which a journalist writes about another country's uh, secrets, so suppose somebody wants to write about the Israeli nuclear program or the Indian nuclear program in a way that infringes domestic laws against secrecy, that the thought that we would uh, extradite a British journalist, uh, somebody who's not Israeli or Indian, uh, to, to uh, serve a long time in prison because you've violated domestic secrecy laws, I find that extraordinary. So. Um, that to me is almost the main reason why I think he shouldn't be extradited. So um, I'm completely w with you on the, on the Espionage Act point. Uh, and Manafort, I can't answer for. I have nothing to do with the Guardian nowadays. Um, the um, the psychological assessment point. Uh, as I say, I mean I think w most journalists, when they're in contact with a source, w think about the motives of that source, uh, and. I think it's probably desirable if it's knowable who the source is, and, and sometimes 
the source doesn't want to be identified, but if the source doesn't mind, uh, and in this case, um, I mean, Julian Assange wasn't quite the source in a conventional sense. The source was Chelsea Manning, but it, 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 it didn't, uh, I mean, Assange was a, a, a known conduit, just as Edward Snowden was. So I think it's reasonable to give the reader some information that helps them to understand their motives. But the main thing with both Assange and with uh, Snowden was the documents. I mean, you, you, you didn't need to rely on, uh, on them, particularly with Snowden. Um, uh, you could just say, well, look, this is, this is the story that the documents tell us. And in a sense, the motives of the source are, uh, are less important. That, that's how I saw it. Um, so we didn't conduct a, a great psychological assessment on him. Um, uh, the, the question about crime, I, th I think I understand. Um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, you know, can you yeah. j just explain that? Yeah. A yeah. According to social ethics, yeah. justice, the obligation of society to an individual and the duty of individuals to society. Yeah. Every person. Yeah. Yeah, can you tell me what the crime is here? What, what, what are you referring to? The crime was uh, the atrocities. You're, you're talking about the I'm alleged war crimes committed by the US military, which Assange as an individual made known to the public. Yeah. No, I'm talking about Assange's obligation right. to yeah. the public. When he comes across material that shows atrocities have been committed, yeah. Yeah. he's obliged by public ethics right. to bring it to our attention. Okay. And because we demand this of to defend him. The best way the best way I can answer that is to say that in in going through the documents that he gave us we joined with him in exposing quite a lot of the crimes you're talking about. So the collateral murder videos. The, 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 uh, we, we wrote extensively about the extent to which uh, the American government and the American military on the ground were complicit in, uh, in uh, acts or turning a blind eye to acts of torture and rendition. So all that we published jointly. Uh, and I completely agree with you that you have a duty to do that. Do you do you also do you also well, agree? And, 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 and Jennifer yeah. Robinson is his, his lawyer, and, and she knows that in the last um, three months I've written about ten pieces defending him. But it's a public obligation. They're okay, Let, let's yeah. okay. park that for now and, and move on. Alan, thank you very much thank indeed. You. I, um, I, I should have made clear when we started, I didn't actually tell you who our, who our speakers are going to be. Um, Alan Rusbridge, who you've just heard from. Our next speaker will be David Aronovich, columnist of The Times. We'll then hear from Jody Ginsburg, who's the chief executive of Index on Censorship, from Vaughan Smith, founder of the Frontline Club, of course, but also a friend of Julian Assange and at one time his host, and from Jen Robinson, who's a lawyer, a barrister at Doughty Street Chambers, and one of the defense team working with Julian Assange. We were hoping that Suzanne Moore of The Guardian would be with us. She unfortunately has had to pull out, so she won't be joining us this evening. Um, David Aronovich, you're next in the dock, or the witness stand. <laughs> Alan, you've left a pound behind you. <laughs> <laughs> it will make no difference to my summing up. Um, David, I know that you don't write the headlines on your columns, but you did write a column about 18 months ago which carried the headline, Assange isn't a dreamer, he's a destroyer. He is in the same destructive club as Putin and Trump. It wasn't a bad reflection of the piece that you wrote. Are you prepared to explain why you regard Assange as a destroyer? Um, the first thing I'm going to say, and I'm not going to dodge this question at all, but one of the things I think that we should try and discuss while we're here 
is what we would be taught, what we'd be saying if this were somebody other than Julian Assange. Okay. Um, because it strikes me, it struck me right from the beginning, for the first time I interviewed him back in 2010, that um, uh, what was going on and what he represented, not in himself and you know, the Swedish charges and so on, or in his nihilism. Um, not, char not, char not charges. Not Swedish allegations. The Swedish, Swedish allegations. The, Swe the Swedish allegations. I mean, I have to tell you that for most people, those kinds of distinctions are pretty small. Uh, and so. Well, okay. All right. Look, all right. Can I just yeah, say we can? You can sit here and heckle me all evening and ask me and then make your great speeches and have a kind of campaign rally, or you can try and have a discussion. It's up to you. Can I? Can well, I just? I can, I, can I? Can I just say? This is designed this evening to be a debate and a discussion. Uh, I know some people have very strong views, but I think it is only right that we should listen to what people have to say. If we disagree with them, there will then be an opportunity to disagree with them. But I would ask you uh, to at least give the speakers whom we've invited to be part of this evening a chance to lay out their position. Thank you. So, David, yes, so, so, well, I, I mean, The point is not that I want to make any comment about Sweden or even Assange as a person okay. uh, for the moment. I mean, they'll come mm. back to your, to, to, to your piece. But the issues raised since WikiLeaks first came upon the scene in 2010 are, are hugely profound ones, and they're extremely difficult ones, like what is actually is journalism? Is anybody who calls himself a journalist a journalist? How far do we make the distinction? Do we not apply the protection to ordinary citizens? And in that sense, the question that was raised over there was quite an interesting one, to people who would do what Assange was doing who are not journalists and so on. But then there becomes the question about the power exercised by the person in his position or any journalist or newspapers or broadcaster's position um, about their accountability and who are they accountable to. So one of the points that I made right the way back in 2010, I made it to him in a debate in the city, I said, to who are you accountable? To who do you, to who do you actually answer? If we want to question the ethics, or if we want to have your what you do uh, to be transparent, I mean, Alan made the point earlier that the motivation of the source was not important. I profoundly disagree with that. I think quite often the motivation of the source is absolutely central. Let me give you an illustration of that. The Russians, had they hacked into the Trump campaign, almost certainly would not have given the emails of the Trump campaign to Julian Assange to leak. Now, I have no idea whether he would have leaked them if he'd got them. I have a slight suspicion that he wouldn't have done. But I don't know it, and I can't, and I can't claim it. So the question about accountability under these sort of circumstances is much more broader. Let me put a, another question uh, to you, which comes more out of the Snowden situation, but also came out of some of the uses, let's say, of the unredacted cables from the US embassies and so on, uh, 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 and other things that were put out, and was particularly highlighted in the question of whether or not, let's say, certain sources were put at jeopardy, mm -hmm. sources for, for the West, which are this. As citizens of a democratic society, do we want our intelligence services, say, to have no secrets? Is that what we want? Uh, if that's not what we want, if, for instance, we don't want them to, the details of their operations, let's say, to curtail terrorism, that's an easy one to choose, then in that case, at what point do we provide a limitation? Now, essentially, what Alan Rusbridge said was, we, at some place like The Guardian or The Times, etc., we do it because we have a set of judgments which we locate in order somehow or other, almost mystically, but actually by a sense of kind of refined processes, um, which we put in place in order to keep ourselves on the right line of that, on the right side of that particular line. So we wouldn't give information, even if we had it, that we thought would be of some kind of use to terrorism, to, to terrorists, even despite the fact that it increased significantly the level of transparency and was a genuine story. So just to make clear where you stand on that, if Chelsea Manning had made that material available, not to Julian Assange, but to you, would you have published it? No, definitely. 
without any without any question. Okay. I mean, so, particularly so to, that, to that extent, you agree with the judgment that both Manning and Assange made was that, that this was information that the public deserved to I, know. I I agreed with the decisions by and large that the Guardian made about which of those things that they got they thought it was suitable to publish. I, remember, I th there was so much detail that I couldn't certainly couldn't second guess them, and I didn't see it. But I couldn't see anything particular that they'd done that didn't kind of fit into what I would think was. I think was appropriate, but in the nine years since that uh, since that uh, happened, and the eight years since that happened, an enormous enormous amount has moved on since then. If we think about the worlds of um, uh, uh, Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, and so on, I don't want to kind of uh, you know give it too much weight. But nevertheless, one of the things that's going uh, is clearly going on is that there are actors in the kind of media sphere in the new media sphere who are essentially let's say in some cases, Russian agents, working as agents of the Russian state, no two ways about it, and are therefore manipulating people within what you might call the journalistic sphere without necessarily, without, well, without, without us finding out until some time later. But why do you now, bring that up in this context? Because what I'm trying to say is that all these things are far more contested or far more problematic than we would like to make them appear. So they are much more difficult. So in the context of what Alan said, and I have an enormous amount of respect for what Alan's done and achieved, as I said, the motivation of the source, for instance, is not to me of no material um, question at all. It's actually, in terms of accountability, a quite an, ex a quite an important question. You see, are you, are you among those people who believe that the actions that he is said to have taken in the run-up to the 2016 US presidential election campaign ought to lead us to reconsider the actions that he took in 2010, no. 2011? Not. No. Okay. Not, uh, not, in, not in any way. I think Alan's outlined, I mean, actually, embarrassingly, um, your summation of your own position on this would be pretty much exactly my position on it. Okay. Uh, he should not be extradited, but if he is, he should be acquitted. Yes. <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty much. I think that that would almost certainly be the uh, be the best outcome. And I, and and, uh, and as Alan quite correctly said, that's pretty, almost certainly what you would want for anybody who wasn't Assange, who was in the same position, and who had by and large done the same things. However, that's not to say that there weren't very difficult questions raised by the WikiLeaks experience. Um, and one of the things you have to ask yourself, and it's, it's kind of uh, kind of interesting, if a whole lot of information, which is let's say state secret, and we may agree or may not agree as citizens that some of it should be, is given to a journalist and then published straight, or anybody, and then published straight, we say that should be uh, supported. If that same information, quite a lot of it, is given to a Ru an agent of the Russian state by a servant of the state, we say they should be prosecuted and quite possibly go to prison for treason. There is a problem here for us to discuss, at the very least. Um, I come down on a particular side, but that's not because I don't recognise the degree of the problem. And there, and there is the area where you apply incredibly fine and difficult journal, uh, 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 judgments. And those are the points, of course, where people from the outside will say, you are compromised in your links or you're thinking about what it is, or the requirements of state, or of the or of the country, or the polity you live in, in terms of what it is you should publish or not publish, redact or not redact. But you have now twice used the phrase "agents of the Russian state," yeah. and yeah. I'm, I'm bound to ask you: Are you suggesting? Are you trying to plant in our minds the possibility that Assange is or was an agent of the Russian state? I don't think it really makes any difference whether he was or he wasn't. I mean, I mean, in, no, 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 no. Sorry, in the in, in the sense in the sense of what he actually did, he might just as well have been, frankly. No, no. I mean, in just just in terms of the actual things that he did in term uh, with, with regard to the leaking of the uh, democratic uh, cables and so on. That is precisely. Just a minute. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. I, just a minute, please. That, just a minute, please. If you would be so kind. That is. They actually did have people in the States trying to do that kind of thing. Um, now, I'm, what I'm not saying is you judge the espionage cases on the basis of that information. But you certainly judge the accountability question. On the, I mean, uh, just to take a tiny kind of little illustration, it always struck me. Everybody loved the Steve Larsen book and Elizabeth Salander, etc. And one of the things that was really interesting about it was that everybody was not allowed to do nefarious things except her. 
she was allowed to look morally by, by by the way the author put it and by the way in which you were invited to take it she was invited to look at everybody's everything online and know everything about everybody and manipulate and we all saw and said yeah that's a that's okay and so on there cannot be such people that's one of the things that we have increasingly discovered through the Cambridge Analytica and, others, and, and, and the Russian bot scam. There cannot be such people. There has to be accountability for them too. Final question then. If it were down to you to decide whether or not Julian Assange deserves our support, how would you answer? I think he deserves our support in not being extradited in the first instance, if he is extradited, as you quite correctly, sagely, magnificently and pithily put yeah, it. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> Some questions from the audience. Right, lady there, because you did try to intervene. A gentleman towards intervene. the back there. Do you have any evidence about the Russian what you say that the Russian spies, something like that. Do you have any kind of evidence about that? I don't know. Okay, what that's the first question. We're, we're going to take three well. in a bunch, and then you can answer all of them. Gentlemen, just back there. Yeah. Um, after uh, nine years and three different prosecutors and one of the longest preliminary investigations in the history of Swedish law uh, and no charges. Will you condemn the British media and broadcast media for promulgating this story for nine years that there is something to answer in Sweden? No, of course Thank I you. won't. There and is. there was one right over in the corner. Yeah. Hello there. I work in whistleblowing policy these days and was very involved in the European Directive on whistleblowing that was passed earlier this year. Um, it's sort of at the leading edge of policy on these issues that we don't talk about the motive of the source. We talk about if someone is deserving of somebody entitled to protection, all they need is a reasonable belief that the information is true. Are we wrong there? Have we missed have we missed the point? Okay, thank you. Um, David. Okay. I don't know what the first question meant, so I'm terribly sorry. I didn't refer to didn't I, I don't think I said that he was a Russian spy. Uh, I said I I said in, in terms, no, agent, agents are not the, exactly the same thing as spies. So that's what. Well, no, no. So, sorry, we certainly know that he was in receipt of Russian information from Russian sources. Now, insofar as now, your claim, your whoa, 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 whoa. your claim, your your claim might be that he was manipulated unwittingly by such sources, not no, not knowing where they came from. That's quite possible. That's quite possibly. That's quite possibly so. That's quite, but, but it wouldn't, but it wouldn't actually, but it wouldn't actually change anything. Okay, Je let, 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 let us move on. Thank you. You've asked the question. You've had your answer. You may not like it, but let us move on. Thank what you. What was the second question? The second question was over there about the Swedish allegations that have been made. Would you be prepared to condemn the British media for having promulgated them? No, of course not. Of course not. I mean. No, I don't believe them, but because they should be, because they should be, they were never promoted by anybody. And people, would you, can you, can you excuse just me, sir, you asked a question, let's hear the answer. I, every time I've even ever read about it, I've said I cannot possibly know whether these charges are true or not. Uh, or, sorry, these allegations. Allegations, whether these allegations are true. It may be your position that, of course, these women were put up to it, so some people in your campaign have suggested, or their patsies of the, or their patsies of the CIA me. state, as some people in your campaign have suggested, or to vilify them or put their names out, as people close to some of your campaigns have done, etc. But it is, has been the role of people to say that these allegations existed and this was where the Swedish state had got up to. And to do anything else would frankly be a betrayal of the readers and a betrayal of the people making the allegations and the people who are investigating them. You took the position right from the beginning without knowing anything about it, without knowing them, that it was not true. So you are actually the person who is guilty of the thing that you're accusing me of. 
OK, thank you. Plenty of We've had a question. We've had an answer. The third question was over there in the corner about the motivation of whistleblowers. Yeah, now that, that, now that, that, that indeed is very interesting. So I'm going to push, push that one straight back to you, but not in your official capacity. Um, would it be justifiable to try and discover the sources for the civil service stories about Jeremy Corbyn? Is it of any importance who those sources were? Yes. Well, thank you. You've just answered the question. <laughs> the motivation of whistleblowers. Right. David, thank you very much You're indeed. Welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, David Aronovic. <laughs> <laughs> you can take the pound if you like. Um, Jody Ginsberg is CEO of Index on Censorship, a... Uh, <laughs> organization which I'm sure is familiar to you all. Um, Jody, you put out a statement after Assange was arrested in which you talked about commitment to freedom of speech being a principle, not about a person, and you said, your organization said, those principles must continue to be defended. Yes. You accept, I assume, that freedom of speech is not an absolute right. I accept it and international law accepts it. If you think about um, Article 10 of the European Convention contains within it uh, the qualifications around when freedom of speech might be curtailed. And one of those uh, accepted curtailments is national security. So following on from that, if the US state has reason to believe that some of the information that Assange from Chelsea Manning passed on to publications infringed their national security. Are they entitled to prosecute him? There are, there are entitlements that governments across the world have to prosecute people for breaches of national security. What hugely concerns me in this case but because in part that it's emblematic of so many other cases internationally, and I think that's really, really key and something that we don't talk about enough, is that the government is using an act meant and intended for spies to punish somebody engaged in what I would term journalistic activity. Now, it's interesting that much of the discussion seems to hinge all the time on whether or not Julian Assange is or isn't a journalist, and I think that distracts us from the much broader question of whether he was in, I, engaged in something that was in the public interest. Governments all over the world try to use national security legislation, espionage acts, to prevent people from getting information that may indeed be in the public interest. That's the definition of news. Um, and if you think about something like the Pentagon Papers, that was exactly what the government tried to do and, and failed. And we know from the Pentagon Papers that that was absolutely valuable public interest information. So to me, the question isn't so much, are they a journalist? Do they even know the truth? It's, it's are they engaged in activity that they believe is providing information that's in the public interest? And, and just quickly to go back to Article, te uh, Article 10, we, I think sometimes when we're having these conversations about free speech and freedom of expression, we, we forget the other part of it, which isn't just freedom of expression gives us all the right to express ourselves all the time and talk. It's also, and contained within that, the right to receive information, to be informed. And that's a right that I think we need to defend much more vocally. I mean, if one thinks of this in British terms, we have an Official Secrets Act. And Section 1 of the Official Secrets Act is roughly... Uh, analogous to the Espionage Act in the US in that it deals with people who disclose questions which have national security implications to the enemy. And there have been times, I mean there may be one or two people here whose memories go back as long as mine do, where journalists have been prosecuted under Section 1 of the Official Secrets Act and there was a huge outcry against it. But my point really is more a, an ethical one than a, a, a legal one. You accept, as a campaigner for freedom of speech, that there are limits and that those limits include information which are directly germane to national security. Yes? I, I'm, I'm yes. Right. You, yeah. you do. So in that, moving that one forward, do you also accept that if there is reason to believe that information being divulged might endanger human life, then that again restricts the freedom both to impart and to receive that information? 
Yes, but I think in all of those cases, you would want to be absolutely certain that the charges definitively could prove that that was the case. And what we're seeing in all of these cases, and I think also of the Australian case where we've just seen uh, the Australian Federal Police go in, uh, metaphorically all guns blazing, I don't know what the data equivalent of that is, but um, uh, on exactly that basis, we believe that that this journal, these journalists are engaged in something that has uh, with national security, that, that by publishing this information, um, so we're going to go in and seize 9,000 documents. And not only that, but we're going to give ourselves, we're going to ask for a warrant that gives us the ability not just to look at that documentation, but to edit and delete information that we find in it. So, so yes, I think the government should retain those rights, but I think we all need to be assured that they're being used in, a, in an extraordinarily targeted and direct way, in a way that demonstrates that, and provably, that the information that was being published or sought to be published definitively is likely to damage national security. And I think that's actually very rare. It is interesting, though, isn't it, that of the 17 charges which Assange faces and on which the US want him extradited, um, specifically refer to bits of information which either name or in other ways identify people who might be at risk in the US view of retaliation because they might be thought to have been conveying sensitive information to the US. Well, my understanding is, is that the way in which it's constructed is sufficiently broad that, that it's plausible to argue that the government has sought to argue that, that all of the activities in seeking that information and publishing that information could potentially have put someone at risk, mm. that it's not sufficiently defined or targeted for that to be demonstratively proven. I mean, th what I find interesting is we've, we've sort of reached a, a point where I think you're saying to us that some of these areas are very fine matters of judgment as to whether a particular piece of information does infringe national security as to whether a specific piece of information might endanger a human life. So my question following on from that is, would you be prepared to accept that a court of law is the appropriate place in which to adjudicate those judgments? Again, I think that depends on the circumstance. I think the court of law can, should determine whether or not something is sufficient to merit, for example, further charges. So, so and, and that's why I think it's problematic. It's not clear to me at all in any of the 18 charges that there is, that the, 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 the charges have sufficient proof sitting beneath them to warrant that kind of argument. So yes, of course, courts are the appropriate place. Index has just published its latest magazine, fully in celebration of the rule of law, Jen will be pleased to know, and the, and the importance of a really, really robust legal system. But it's not clear in this case, uh, to me certainly, that, that, that those very targeted charges are proven. And, and what worries me is governments they increasing... Won't be, they won't be proven until they're adjudicated, No, I mean, I mean th there's, there's grounds to then ah, okay. issue... So there's grounds to issue proceedings. Sorry, that's what okay, I mean. Right. Um, and what worries me is that that's... You know, the US is just the tip of the iceberg. We are seeing this repeatedly, that governments who want to use national security legislation to silence journalists deliberately go for the widest possible uh, net of suspicion. So uh, if we look at the case of the two Northern... And we don't have to go very far away, right? The case of the two Northern Irish journalists who just this in the last uh, month had warrants against them quashed. The warrants were extraordinarily broad. They gave they gave the police the right to go in and seize all sorts of information, and and so governments deliberately use that sort of vagueness mm -hmm. to be able to go in and target all sorts of things. And and so while I would want the law to retain that ability, I would want it to be extraordinarily targeted and focused. And it is not currently. I mean, some people here might re remember the name Clive Ponting who uh, in the early 1980s, after the Falklands War, he was an official in the Ministry of Defence, and he leaked, not to a journalist, but to a member of parliament, uh, information which suggested that uh, an Argentine warship 
was attacked by British forces, not while it was steaming towards the British task force, but steaming away. And he was charged under the Official Secrets Act, <coughs> very <coughs> serious Official Secrets offences. Um, the jury acquitted him. It was a remarkable verdict, I mean, a perverse verdict, in the sense that the evidence was perfectly clear. He accepted that he'd leaked the information, but he just said he believed it was in the public interest to do so. There is no public interest defence, but nevertheless, the jury said, sod that, we think you were right to do so, and they acquitted. Um, and so I suppose the point I'm making to you is, might it not be better, in this particular case, for Julian Assange to go down the same route, to defend what he did, to argue what, that it was in the public interest. There is no public interest defense. No, I know. On the there wasn't for Clive Ponting there, either. There, but, so Clive Ponting was incredibly lucky. He, facing a different jury, they may well have decided yeah. that given that there is no public interest defense under mm -hmm. the, the Official Secrets Act or under the Espionage Act, he would be found guilty because he was guilty of mm -hmm. leaking that information. And so what you're then relying on is a jury actually in effect, ignoring the law. And I think uh, uh, that to me is... Isn't that what all jury trials do? No, I think the they law should the be there. I, I, think, I think the law should be there to largely protect our rights. And the fact that there is no public interest offence for the Espionage Act is extremely disturbing. Right, Jody. thank you. That's enough from for, for, for me. <laughs> few questions from the audience. Gent well, uh, you've already had one question, so let me see if there's anybody else before I come. Yep, right at the back there. Anybody else? Do you believe the British media failed Julian Assange? I mean, he has spent nine years in this country, seven of these, uh, seven of these nine years confined in a building with not even an hour outdoors. In my country, Italy, we give an hour outdoors to, to some of the worst mafia killers. And uh, in these last seven years, not the BBC, not the Guardian, not even a newspaper there to say we shouldn't treat a human being this way. Okay, thank you. Uh, there was somebody over here. Yeah, lady, lady there. Whoops, hang on. Sorry. How would you consider the public interest with regards to um, sharing information, um, providing information that clearly uh, impacts an election. Do any of our other panelists want to ask a question, by the way? You have the right to do so. You can ask the others if the panelists want to ask. Everyone <laughs> sat up. Uh, yeah. Hi, thanks very much. Um, don't you think we have to be extremely careful indeed uh, what allowance we give our potential puppet masters to hide a great deal behind the wall of secrecy. All sorts of things, uh, abuses of this are great, great fear. 200 years ago, it was common knowledge in the street, and commonly argued in the street, that the use of the defense of national security was the last refuge of a scoundrel. And Benjamin Franklin said uh, that people who give up their right to know in exchange for higher security, will get neither. This is about puppet mastery. There is an argument, and it nearly occurred in Sweden, that you're better <coughs> off not allowing any secrets. The general benefit is much greater. With certain national security exceptions. Well, and um, crime, and crime fighting exceptions. Thank you, Robin, for correcting me. You're very welcome. OK. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, OK, okay. so I'm actually going to go backwards. Um, while I agree, of course, that we should we should act with great scepticism about anybody just simply waving the, the national security flag to prevent us reporting, I, I would make a defence for um, security and privacy. There are many, many reasons, and not just to do with state security, that we might want to keep information secret. All of us, and I see some people here, um, uh, many of the people that we work with work in highly repressive regimes where I wouldn't want information about those individual activists or journalists or their whereabouts or who they're dealing with or the fact that, or who their sources are to be leaked because it would directly put them in danger and put their sources in danger. So I think this sort of 
um, I think you termed it information anarchy, is not something necessarily that I would wholeheartedly support because I think in many cases that it does not promote democracy. It's used for suppression, that kind of leaking of information. Um, your question about the media failure. <sighs> Look, I think there are many cases where everybody, including the media, can do better to highlight injustice. Julian Assange, I would argue, is pretty high profile. I wish that many of the individuals that we worked with um, who have been imprisoned, um, uh, tortured, who have been um, unfairly extradited for their own expression, got half as much attention it, sometimes as Julian Assange. So um, while you know, I, I understand that for many in the British media, his actions are problematic, and sometimes that's interesting because it's not always that the British media have acted entirely um, without uh, um, without honor with, with honor. But um, y you know, I I think there is a lot of pressure and interest in Assange that we don't necessarily see for other media freedom cases. And what was the the, other the, the last point was was over there ab about just. The the, the idea that governments traditionally hide behind national security as a reason not to allow information out. Oh, the elections. The ele that was right, the elections question. I think, again, that sometimes is difficult to um, know with hindsight. So information that you might deem to be in the public interest because you think that it's important to know, you know, and I think this comes back to, to David's point and why I slightly disagree about motive, is that you may be leaking something because you want to um, cast dispersions on the other side, but you may also do it because you genuinely believe that it's in the public interest to know something about that, let's say, that individual who is standing to be leader. So whether or not somebody is providing information to influence an election is not always as easy to identify as you might think it is. I think. Dib you know, which is different to say being able to identify organised attempts to issue disinformation, which is a slightly different question, I think. But you were a journalist in a previous life, weren't it, you? I, yes, so occasionally you, I do you, dabble in a bit of journalism. There you go. So, so, so you know Recovering. that when, when people come to you with information, one of the first things you have to do as a journalist is assess their credibility. Yes, but your job as a journalist is not just is is to assess their credibility and then make your own checks as a as a journalist yeah. um but but the important thing i think is do you believe not necessarily do you believe that individual but do you believe the information in front of you and then do you believe that information in front of you and then do you believe that it is important enough that it ought to be out there in the public interest to serve the right not just for ourselves to express ourselves freely but the right to receive information Jody, thank you very much. Jody Ginsburg. So Vaughan Smith, Godfather of the Frontline Club, but not here in that capacity. Not in that capacity. Um, no, Vaughan, you're here because you know Julian Assange very well. I do. You yes. hosted him in your home for yeah. a little over a year. Thirteen months. Thirteen yeah. months. You were extremely visible and active in his defence right from the word go. You heard Alan Rusbridger earlier on talk about Julian's capacity for falling out with people. Have you fallen out with him? No, I haven't. Um, uh, I, don't, I haven't fallen out with him, but, and, and, and there are plenty of people who haven't. I mean, I think um, what Alan describes is, you know, something we see quite a lot in the media, strong characters like people who run newspapers, <laughs> um, you know, people who run organisations like this. I mean, they, they, they can conflict. I'm, I, I didn't see too much in it. I, didn't, I wouldn't um, cast Julian as somebody who falls out with everybody. Um, he falls out with some people like we all do. Um, not everybody likes me. Interesting. So why do you think then that he has gained a reputation for being difficult, um, temperamental, uh, many people use the word adjective narcissistic, um, arrogant. I mean, the, the adjectives, the hostile adjectives that you've used against him are legion. Why? Well, I mean, I, I, I think it's pretty obvious. Um, I think he's, um, he's been smeared in an industrial scale. I think the amount of, uh, no, no, let me, let me speak, come on. 
look, please, I mean, l let's have this conversation. Let's just, let's be quiet and listen to everybody. I just think it'll be much easier. Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it's, um, uh, can, I'll tell you what I'd like to do. I'd mm -hmm. like to start out because there's somebody called Nils Meltzer, who is the U, because I think it explains my point, who is the UN uh, special rapporteur on torture. Arguably, uh, the you know the the, the most senior um, authority on the subject on the planet, um, and I think this does answer it. I'm going to read out something he wrote. Now he struggles to get his articles. He's about to release a report about Julian Assange. He struggles to get his articles in British newspapers um, and uh, or on um, uh, on broadcasters. But I just want to quote from an article because I think it's, it, it says everything. So, uh, you know, in 20 years of work with victims of war, violence, and political persecution, I have never seen a group of democratic states ganging up to deliberately isolate, demonize, and abuse a single individual for such a long time with so little regard for human dignity and the rule of law. Assange has been systematically slandered to divert attention from the crimes he's exposed. Um, and I think that is absolutely true. And if you look at the way the media has behaved, I'm a journalist, I love journalism. I've started a club to try and support what's good in journalism. But actually, I look at the way um, we've treated Julian and I'm horrified. I think we've been part of this sort of demonization of a man. Um, and uh, you, know, you, you can illustrate it, I, I illustrate it all, all the time. I mean, why are we reading articles about whether he washes or smells or mistreats cats or or, 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 you know, why are we not contesting it when the Ecuadorian president does, it tells us, which we know not to be true, I certainly do, um, that he wipes shit all over the walls or did so. I mean, I think this is beneath us, and I think it has contributed to him being in Belmarsh. And why is he in Belmarsh? Why did he have a red notice from Interpol? Because um, we're in, you know, he's enjoying a sort of lawfare where there's a sustained well-funded attempt to demonize him um, and I think that journalists um, owed him more they owed him um, uh, to, to, they, they owed him some protection from this vast expense um, to, 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 to make him look like somebody we don't like. Okay, we're in a room and there are clearly lots of supporters, but it's quite rare for me to be supporting him with lots of supporters, <laughs> I'll tell you that. Do you accept the argument at all that the treatment of him might have been significantly different if he hadn't jumped bail? That it looked as if, by seeking refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy, he was trying to escape justice, he was trying to hide from the judicial process, and that he, I mean, he cost you rather a lot of money and various other people who put up sureties for him as well. Um, but it seems to me, at least, that there was a, a shift in the way in which he was portrayed once he took that action. Yeah, yes, there was. Um, but, uh, and uh, talking about the Swedish thing, because it needs to be talked about, um, though, um, I, I don't enjoy it much, but um, there's no doubt that the women involved, and I suggest it's probably one who's still keen to follow this up, need their day in court and ha have deserved it and may never get it. But Julian deserved that too. Now, we're all blaming him for this, and I think that's not entirely true. He was clearly advised um, not to go to Sweden. It was his last opportunity to get asylum, which he was given. Um, and when you look at the whole course that this has taken, Personally, I wasn't there, I don't know what happened, um, though it's pretty hard when you do look at the evidence to see that, uh, you know, see that there is any that we've seen that's against him. Um, but the reason that uh, he hasn't been, uh, there aren't any charges, we had that talk about their charges allegations, I attribute to the Crown Prosecution Service in this country and the, um, the prosecutor um, in Sweden. We're talking about a case that uh, a prosecutor squashed once and then was raised again. We're talking about 40 press conferences or press releases from the Swedish prosecutor um, uh, designed to defame him. Um, you know, he was never interviewed when he could be. I, I, it is pretty clear to me, I was close enough to see that there wasn't really an attempt to prosecute, there's an attempt to defame. I think this has fitted in to an attempt to um, portray Julian as somebody who he shouldn't support, and I think that's why he's in Belmarsh. Well, he's in Belmarsh because that suggests that he's a danger to us. He had a red notice because that suggests that he's a, there's a danger to us, and I feel that 
um, journalists could have quite easily pushed this stuff over the, the wider thing. But instead, what's happened? So there, there was when when we, we treated him like a caged animal. Um, it's it's it's. I think it's been really ugly the way the press have treated Julian, um, and I'm incredibly disappointed and upset by it. Um, we've treated him like somebody who we've enjoyed prodding. Um, you know, we, he's been described well I, when he was when he was released. I just like to read out some of the things that were r reported about him. Um, when he, when he was released, um, uh, not r wrong, released, when the, the British police were allowed to go and lift him out, um, uh, you know, uh, the newspapers, I won't name newspapers, I don't really like naming newspapers, I, I, I want to change people's op opinions and, and, and behaviour than, than, than finger people, but you know, that'll wipe the smile off his face, you know, describes the downfall of a narcissist, removed from inside his fetid lair to finally face justice, an unwanted guest who abused his hospitality, no one should feel sorry for the overdue of eviction, everybody's least favourite swatter has been kicked out of the Ecuadorian embassy, a grumpy, stroppy teenager a demented looking gnome. It goes on and on and on. This stuff is beneath us. Um, and we've been prodding him because we can. And I just think, I think it's, it's unattractive. That is partially why he's in the embassy. And so I, w I would say, okay, it's easy. There are lots of reasons why we're told we shouldn't like Julian. But you can. I like Julian. He's very good company. I think you should too. I want to ask you a question that I asked Jody Ginsburg, which is to do whether you accept the need for some information not to be in the public domain for reasons of national security, because you are a yeah. former soldier. Oh, you, yeah. you served in the military. You yeah. presumably have some understanding of why not all information can be publicly available in certain circumstances. So I just wonder what your take is from your vantage point as a former military officer of the argument that there are certain pieces of information which cannot for reasons of national security, be in the public domain. Oh, I completely agree with what Jody said. Um, I, mean, I think it, it's, but the, the, the point is, this whole debate about transparency was brought up by Julian. What worries me is why it hasn't um, been discussed fully, because there's this, this tendency to talk about Julian the man um, deflects us from it. I mean, the BBC, the only broadcaster I, I'll mention, actually, because uh, yeah, you're our employer, um, they, they very ex -employer, they, they very rarely talk about e the, the issues. They talk about the man, and I think this is a problem. So we're not really, you know, if, if, if we rely on the press to promote a genuine debate, which incidentally in this instance was promoted by Julian, it didn't really happen, um, you have to really wonder why it didn't happen because when you do have a debate between security and freedom normally security wins people are worried about the security more than they want mm -hmm. their freedom and, and 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 so you know what have they got to hide that they didn't really sponsor that debate and they undermined it and and and, and the way that we've trivialized this whole conversation the but, other but just to probably yeah. answer your question as an ex-soldier i absolutely think that it's uh, essential that some things need to be secret i've spoken to julian about it several times and he's twice said to me that he he isn't a proponent of radical transparency i'm not quite sure where he exactly uh, draws the line um but uh, you know he, he that's what he said the other question which i asked jody and i'd be interested in your thoughts on this is, is the idea that the proper place to test where that line is drawn is actually in a court of law um, if we go back, somebody mentioned Daniel, uh, Daniel Ellsberg uh, a sh short time ago, who in the 1970s uh, released the Pentagon Papers and had the book thrown at him, was prosecuted. He didn't flee bail. He went and had his day in court. And again, he walked out of court a free man. Um, there is an argument that Julian Assange would have found it much easier to retain support if he had been prepared to do the same thing? Um, if he'd been prepared to do what exactly? To, to, fa to face court. Uh, where? In Sweden or where? Well, first of all, here, obviously, and then if the But Swedes he did. I mean, he, he's, he, he's, he's, been in, he's been in court here quite a lot. I think I've been in most of them. Um, quite long, it's been, and expensive for him. Um, uh, no, I mean, the, the, the Swedish thing that, you know, he, has, he claimed asylum instead of the Swedish thing. But there is an issue with the courts here. Um, I, I think that... Um, the legal process is being used really by the Americans and supported by us as a vehicle um, for revenge, uh, to present him as somebody to dissuade others from, you know, to give him an unpleasant experience so other people don't imitate what he's doing. Um, and I think it's, it's not wholly dissimilar to uh, Salisbury. The Russians do it differently. They'll put some poison on a doorknob. Um, the Americans want their man and they want to lock him up forever, and, and that's their way of communicating. So this is about vengeance, which I think is incredibly unsavory. Um, fundamentally, 
Um, I do not believe that Julian receives equality under the law that the rest of us would expect in this country. And that is a basic um, expectation we have. And the law in this instance, it's, it's a sort of, uh, it, 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 it's, it's being weaponized against him because it's being, the judicial process exists to get him to America. And that's what's happening. Any questions for Vaughan? Uh, there's one here. Yep. Um, you, you talked about the way that journalists um, have profiled Assange um, because we can. Mm -hmm. But there are other people involved, as we've heard, in the um, process before something is published. Um, do you not think, I mean, I, I'd like to know your views on why um, so many newspapers and um, journalism outlets have abandoned him? Thank you. Anybody from this part of the room over here? I see nobody. It's like being an auctioneer, isn't it? Okay, yes, down here in the front. I have two. Is that okay? Yeah. First one is, do you, are you saying by what you just said, Vaughan, is that you have no faith in the independence of the judiciary in this country, in the United States? That's my first question. Okay. My second question is, do you think that reporting on WikiLeaks receiving information from Russian military intelligence is part of the smear campaign? Somebody right at the back. Hi, um, I was there the day when he stepped out onto the balcony uh, to give his speech. And to me, it seems as though he enjoyed the press and the publicity, and he had hundreds of media outlets from across the world. Um, do you not think at that point he enjoyed the media attention and, again, kind of drawing from the lady's first question, the whole world seems to be against him, and surely that's not just one view, it's all views, and kind of from that, how he enjoyed the media attention and then quickly drew back from that when, she w when he kind of realised it wasn't in his corner, so from that, what, how do you think that's changed? You know, even when not too long ago we had that video of him coming out and obviously that wasn't from his side, that was a leak from whoever. It's the media attention that I think he once enjoyed and when he didn't get the response he wanted, do you think it that his sort of um, persona changed over the years? Okay, thank you. Well, I mean, uh, I, mean I, I saw him quite a lot in the Ecuadorian embassy, particularly in the last year, uh, because I could see that he was really suffering. Um, and uh, I saw that actually he had changed. He's, you, know, you know, 10 years of the suffering he's had had changed him. Um, so I had seen changes um, which I thought uh, were, were very good changes uh, 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 in terms of the way he viewed the world. Um, I, I, as for this uh, Russia thing, um, <coughs> Um, uh, he denies that it, the Russians were a source. He's made it very clear. Um, there's been no evidence uh, that I've seen that suggested. I mean, the Mueller report, which is a, a police report, doesn't provide any evidence. So I think you know the, the judge is out. You know, the, the, the observation I find quite amusing that he could conceivably work for Russian intelligence. I'd hate to be his handler. Crikey, the worst job in the world. I mean, he's a, rather he's, he's somebody who's absolutely not controllable as an individual. <laughs> Well, no, uh, he's denied that. He's d he denies that. I don't know that. I haven't seen any evidence that that's the so case. The 17 American agencies that think that the source of the information, the hacks. Yeah. The well, look, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to leave it there because I don't think there is evidence to support that that I have seen. Um, it's not relevant today in terms of the charges. Um, and fundamentally, we were talking earlier when we're listening to um, uh, Alan, he's talking, you know, he, he, he's he appears to believe that it's the information is more important necessary than the source, and it's an important debate about where it comes from, and I accept that. Um, but the, the point about outside the embassy, uh, 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 there, I think there are a couple of occasions where he spoke from the balcony, um, and um, on one of them, a British broadcaster, to illustrate my point, 
sent a freelancer in a dinner jacket with a megaphone to heckle him. This is what I'm talking about, you know. It's a bit like the Colosseum, prodding him, you know, in his, you know, in his embassy. I think that was cruel, actually. I don't think it's our role as journalists to be cruel. I think he deserved the same sort of protection that many of us feel the women deserve, and he didn't get it. Um, and I'd just like to say something else. I mean, it's Julian Assange's birthday tomorrow. He's going to be 48. Um, he will have spent 10 years having lost some level of liberty and totally at the moment and considerably um, the last year in the Ecuadorian embassy he was tr really mistreated. I saw that. Um, but the, of all the crimes that he's released, all the information, uh, you know, the, 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 the leaks, nobody's gone to prison for any of that and yet he's in prison. Um, Chelsea Manning's in prison at the moment. Um, and and, and I, 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 I would like to see um, the British and American media pull a little back from the personal attacks and try and uh, uh, realize that they have a responsibility to Julian as well as everybody else involved and they have a responsibility to if you read the British press you would consider that our that, that you know the spies have nothing to do because there's that you know there's no intelligence or psycho psy, uh, psyops against Julian of course there is we know that um, but it's not reported and we would assume that he gets treated equally under the law and and uh, uh, and the smear, we've done nothing to the, the, you know, the fact that you go online, there are millions and millions and millions of associations with him you know, a, a, as a rapist. Um, and the, the, the number of times that we, um, uh, you, we, we misreport, factually misreport the, you know, the allegations vers you know, versus the charges is a classic one that came up today, but it happens all the time. Can I just ask you, Vaughan, to respond to the other question which came from here, is do you have any faith in the independence of the British judiciary? Um, much less than I did before, um, because I, I think the I think um, that um, the Br the British were clearly. If you look at the Crown Prosecution Service, uh, we now know because of an incredible uh, journalist in in uh, Italy called um, Maurizio. Oh, is she? Oh well, uh, well, fantastic job by the way. But you know. Um, um, I mean, I, she should be talking, not me. She should be here, not me. I mean, four years she, she's been trying to bash away with the Freedom of Information um, uh, 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 Act here to try to get information about what the Crown, Crown Prosecution Service have been doing. She's already broken through with the Swedes and revealed that, that, that you know, not all is right here. Um, they've clearly not been trying to prosecute. It's clearly been about trying to, you know, defame Julian rather than actually get on with any prosecution. So, it, you know, the, the, the women should be blaming the, prosecution, the prosecutors, um, and it's been incredibly unfair the way that um, uh, Julian's been painted as, as the person who's the entire problem. Okay, Vaughan, we're going to have to stop there because we are running a little short of time. We've still got one more speaker. So, Vaughan Smith, thank you very much. Thank you. So, uh, Jen Robinson is a barrister at Dowdy Street Chambers. She's part of the defence team working with Julian Assange and has been for a while. I think. Yeah, okay. Um, I want to talk about the law a little bit, Jen, because I'm a bit of a law groupie. Can we start with the basics? In order for a British court to agree to the US request for extradition, what does the US have to establish? Well, a range of factors, not least of which double criminality. Um, obviously, there's going to be a huge fight, and I don't want to talk too much about it because we're obviously going to be having that fight here. But there'll be a range of issues raised around double criminality, whether this is a crime in the UK, and also free speech concerns about whether the British courts will extradite in circumstances where there's key free speech issues raised. OK, so if the charges which the US have brought would be criminal offences in the UK, then that would make it m more likely that a British court would agree that he should be extradited. It is one of a range of factors one, okay. that the court will look at. So my earlier point about how the charges brought under the Espionage Act are roughly equivalent to similar charges that might be brought under the Official Secrets Act, is that relevant in the, in, in the extradition hearing? Potentially, yes, but I think we did discuss earlier, and you raised some earlier examples of journalists being prosecuted here, which rightly raised significant outrage in this country about being prosecuted under the Official Secrets Act. We're talking about the United States seeking a journalist from outside of the country, as Alan quite rightly pointed out, an extraordinary position, where a journalist who is not American, who is not based in America, is, going to be, is being sought for extradition and prosecution for having breached the domestic security laws of the United mm. States. 
this is a precedent that should set all journalists, um, keeping them awake at night at least, about if you are publishing, receiving and publishing information from a source, which is protected journalistic activity, you publish that information, which is truthful information, information that's demonstrated war crimes, human rights abuse, corruption the world over, won journalistic awards the world over, that you could be pro extradited and prosecuted to a foreign state, Saudi Arabia, Russia, China. That no. is the precedent that we're talking about right now. Because normally extradition requests concern a national who is in a foreign country and the government of the state of which they are national want him, want him or her back, yes, to face charges on his or her home territory. Not necessarily. It's about whether you've committed a crime in that state. In that state, okay. Now, Assange, as you say, is not an American. His actions didn't take place on US soil. The only American involvement is that it was their secrets that he was party to publishing. In law, does that count? That it's American secrets, and therefore that they have jurisdiction? Well, that is a jurisdictional argument that will be made, which is this has damaged the United States and therefore we can exercise jurisdiction over those who have damaged our country. But again, I ask everybody in the room and I ask all journalists and media organisations, are we comfortable with a precedent where a foreign country could seek the extradition of a British journalist? Jul Julian is obviously Australian, but the precedent being set is that a British journalist could be sought for extradition and prosecution in Saudi Arabia or Russia or China for having published the secrets of that state, no matter what the public interest involved. That is a terrifying precedent that we must stand against. The um, council representing the US state in uh, Westminster Magistrates Court two weeks ago, Ben Brandon, said, by publishing unredacted material on the internet, Assange created a grave and imminent risk that human intelligence sources, including journalists, human rights defenders, and political activists, would suffer serious physical harm or arbitrary detention. Do you have an answer to that? I have a number of answers to that. The first is, um, the reason WikiLeaks published the redact unredacted cables at all Let's remember back in 2010, there was a process with the media organizations, which Alan just described. Each media organization submitted their redactions and they together with WikiLeaks published the cables in redacted format. The only reason WikiLeaks later, much later, published the unredacted cables was because David Lee of The Guardian published the password to the Cablegate file in his book. The information was circulating online for 48 hours before WikiLeaks published it. That story is very rarely told. That is what happened. Second, in the Chelsea Manning pre-trial, and trial in fact, US military intelligence officers, or at least one in particular, gave evidence under oath that not one person was harmed as a result of these publications. Bring the evidence if there is any. The, the case, as I understand it, though, that the US is making is, is a slightly different one. It's not that they were harmed, but they would be at greater risk of being harmed as a result of Assange's actions. That, I mean, that, that's a substantial difference, isn't it? Well, that's, that's a hypothetical question, isn't it? A potential yeah. risk of potential harm. That journalists and editors have to make this, dis make this calculation all the time. As a journalist, if you received evidence of war crimes and you thought, well, if I publish this, I might put someone at risk, would you not still publish it? A lot of the information, of course, that WikiLeaks published, and they're not the subject of the charges that have been brought, were not to do with war crimes at all. I mean, the State Department cables and all of the diplomatic chit-chat and so on, that was just interesting, but it wasn't to do with war crimes. But with, within the context of that information, there was evidence of torture, there was evidence of war crimes, there was evidence of human rights abuse. Those cables were of immense public interest. Amnesty International has said that WikiLeaks contributed to the Arab Spring by making that publication. I mean, this is immense public interest, and to, to suggest that a potential risk with no documented harm to anyone should justify the, public, the prosecution of a journalist or a publisher for having published that information is, I think, again, a terrifying suggestion. Can I just ask you one question about the Swedish allegations? You're probably better placed than most of us mm -hmm. to explain exactly what the status of that investigation of those allegations currently is? It is a preliminary investigation, and um, as the audience, which is a much friendlier audience that I'm used to, as Vaughan said, that I'm used to facing. We do our best, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, it is a preliminary investigation in which no charges have been laid. This has been opened and closed, as Vaughan said many times. Um, taking the allegations at their highest, there are serious questions with the evidence, but of course, Julian was, was and has always been willing to answer them. He's offered his testimony. He was questioned inside the embassy. He continually litigated in Sweden to try and force the prosecutor to take his testimony so he could resolve it without putting himself at the risk of US extradition. He walked into the embassy not to hide from the Swedish allegations, but to protect himself from the very outcome that he now faces, which is US extradition. I don't think that um, it is fair the way that he has been treated in the media. Even today, David saying that um, the WikiLeaks campaign have put out the women's names, that's actually not correct. The Swedish police published their names. We said the campaign, but actually it came from, it actually, the women's names were published by the Swedish authorities, not by the WikiLeaks campaign. So I think there's a lot of things that are said which are, um, which I think circulate in the media and then become accepted truths. And and as the public, I think we ought to regard, sort of ask ourselves questions about what's been put out into the public domain and, and what the actual facts are. And, and you can read online the agreed facts of the Supreme Court in the extradition proceedings, which were agreed between the CPS and the Swedish Prosecution Authority and um, our defense team. So go and have a look at those, because I think it's important to, and that's a, that is an agreed set of facts between both parties, read it. As I understand it, the current position of the Swedish prosecutor is that given that Assange is now in custody, there is no reason yet for the Swedes to make an extradition request because they have access to him uh, that's, at Belmarsh. That's right. So sorry, I, I didn't give you the current situation. So the case was dropped in 2017 by the then prosecutor having questioned him in the embassy. Uh, there is one outstanding potential allegation, which is um, the rather strange definition under Swedish law of minor rape. No rape is minor, but that's it is it is not exactly rape as we would understand it under British law. That investigation has been reopened after he was arrested and taken out of the embassy, and it's ongoing. But they have failed to get an arrest warrant for his detention, um, and so it remains to be seen what happens with those allegations. But we are confident, and his Swedish defence counsel is confident of his defence. We would have happily had him answer those allegations in court in Sweden had he been given an assurance against extradition to the United States. We requested that. We asked the Australian government to request that. The Ecuadorians, once he went into the embassy, asked the Swedes to give that, asked the UK to give it. No one would do so. So it to suggest that he is somehow denying those women justice is not correct. It's still possible that the Swedes might lodge an extradition request at a future date. If that were so, my understanding is it's up to the Home Secretary to decide which gets precedent, the Swedish extradition request or the US one, is that right? That's correct. There's a decision by the Home Secretary over which extradition request will take precedence, and it's based on a number of factors, including the seriousness of the allegations and the timing of the request. So I think the Home Secretary would be in a rather difficult position. Yes. Well, we'll have to see who the Home Secretary is and if the question even arises. That's right. Or indeed if we even have one. Um, <laughs> Jen, thank you. Um, questions from the audience? Uh, yes, down here. Yes, um, there's one thing that um, has concerned me is that it's kind of been repeated here today. Mrs. Oh, Smith yeah. says, oh, can you hear now? Yeah. One thing that concerns me is the extent to which these ideas of this um, rather crazy, unfounded theory about WikiLeaks Russia um, being somehow in cahoots in seeking to disrupt the US election. Um, this has been repeated many times on the BBC without challenge. It was repeated in the House of Commons on the 11th of um, April without challenge. Um, it was mentioned, uh, you said that on the website for this debate. Yes, um, <laughs> his documented collaboration with Russian intelligence to disrupt Hillary Clinton's election campaign. Um, it concerns me very much that this is simply repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated, um, as though even prior to the Mueller report that Mr. Smith mentioned, we already knew that there was no evidence for this, and it seems to be a way, uh, just another way, 
of uh, making this person a very, very vulnerable to being destroyed. Now, uh, it struck me today, the last time I was here was many years ago. It was for a memorial event for Anna Palikowska, and someone attending um, that event was Alexander Litvinenko. And I was very chilled and sickened at the time um, by the way that uh, what happens when the machinery of a state decides that it is hell-bent on destroying an individual, the extraordinary power it has to do so, how easily public opinion can be turned, and how people can be diminished and turned to dirt in people's eyes so that they can then be um, utterly destroyed. And um, I'm very mindful as we sit here, this has been a really very interesting debate, and thank you for that. But I do feel that um, this man is down the road um, he has been targeted and made into nothing in the public's eyes in order that he can be destroyed because he has revealed, just as Palikovsky did, just as Litvinenko did, uh, really horrific things perpetrated by governments. Um, and um, do I have a question at the end? No, of right, no. I mean, you, I you, suppose you, you, you've, I've made, I've a very, you've made a very eloquent point. So well, I'm not sure yeah, about eloquent. Leave, but, uh, leave, leave, leave it there. Yeah, gentlemen here. Um, yeah, David Aronovich uh, as well. Um, could we address or try to shed some light on this Manafort story uh, in The Guardian? Um, is there any truth behind it at all? And uh, firstly, um, secondly, what are the motives for The Guardian publishing that story? And thirdly, did the story actually come from military intelligence in the first place? Uh, as part of, of what we've just, uh, uh, what's been referred to as this sort of governmental um, campaign against uh, against Julian okay. and his activities. Let me see if Jen wants to answer that first. Well, I think there's been three key points raised, and I'll address each of them, and I'm glad you raised the Russia issue. Um, the impact of the propaganda and stories, PSYOPs campaigns, as, as Vaughan described them, and the Manafort story, so I'll, I'll address each of them. I'm glad you raised the Russia issue because, of course, the um, charges that he's now facing in the US have absolutely nothing to do with the 2016 elections, and the, the Mueller report has not recommended any prosecution of WikiLeaks in any way, shape or form. Also to say, Julian has himself said that he didn't receive the information from the Russian state and has made that very clear. Um, WikiLeaks has never even confirmed that they published Goose for Two information, which is said to be the, the Russian intelligence front source. Yet other media organisations have said so. The Hill, The Intercept, Politico. All of these organisations publish the same material. Why is it that Julian Assange and WikiLeaks is being targeted and singled out, not just by the Mueller inquiry, but by the media more broadly? Other organisations publish that material. Of course, the Manafort story. Now, obviously, he Manafort himself complete, fervently denied any suggestion that he'd ever vi visited Julian or tried to immediately when that story came out. Julian, of course, has also um, denied it. But what is extraordinary about this story is that the Guardian themselves have the visitor logs. They've been publishing uh, <laughs> extensive material from inside the embassy, videos, photographs, the visitor's log, and I can tell you as someone who had to visit Julian in that embassy a lot, if you wanted to visit him, there was a visitor's form which was quite extensive and ex intrusive about what information you had to give Ecuador before you could come into the embassy, including the serial numbers of your phone. So the fact that no evidence of Manafort ever having applied to visit him, videos of him being in there, when the Guardian says they have all of this information and has been reporting on all other kinds of people that were inside the embassy, I, found, I find implausible. That story could have been checked out with basic journalistic checking and it wasn't and they haven't retracted it and it's a journalistic Let me just problem. check, is there anybody from The Guardian in the room here who's able to And respond? I would welcome having that conversation with them and having no, those, okay, those just, questions just answered. Okay. Um, the, the final point that we haven't discussed is this, this the role of the PSYOPs campaign and the vilification in the media of Julian Assange. I think that the media is complicit in allowing what Donald Trump has just done. And I say that because in 2010, when the grand jury was opened, we were saying consistently, the media must stand with WikiLeaks because you cannot 
you cannot distinguish between the act of what WikiLeaks does and what mainstream media organisations do all the time. As Alan put it very eloquently in a piece that he wrote, um, Julian does what good journalists should be doing um, all the time. And tonight, what honourable journalists should be doing is the, the exact phrase he used. We said then you need to stand with WikiLeaks because there needs to be a solidarity campaign against this precedent being set. The very fact of a criminal investigation being opened by the Obama administration is dangerous. Now, what happened the moment it got into the hands of the Trump administration? Precisely what we warned about. Now, had the media stood with Julian and stood with WikiLeaks on the principle of the matter, you don't have to agree with everything he does and says. You don't have to agree with every publication decision they make. But the principle and the legal protection that must stand and must because it defends not, it's not just for WikiLeaks, it's for all journalists and publishers. We must take that principled position. Instead, what happened was an ongoing vilification campaign to seek to other him and other WikiLeaks and try to make them look like they're something else. As we heard from Jody tonight, it doesn't matter whether you consider him a journalist or not. The First Amendment and Article 10 protects journalistic activity, whoever you are. That is the principle that we have to defend. And had the media stood with him, I don't think it would be politically feasible to bring the charges that have just been brought. Jen, thank you. That's an excellent note to finish on. Uh, we've overrun our time, but it has been, a, I think, a very interesting evening. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you for being largely well-behaved. And thank you, of course, to all of our panellists. Thank you very much indeed.